Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. He says, I, am, I was keeping them. Well, I'll go up to verse 11. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Ooh, this is huge. First of all, go to the phrase, Holy Father. In this verse is the only verse in Scripture where God the Father is called Holy Father, and he's called Holy Father by none other than the Holy Son, Jesus Christ. Go to verse 25, quickly ahead. He now continues his prayer, and he now calls the Father the Righteous Father, which is kind of like first base, second base. They're all in the ballpark there, okay? They're all in the game. A little bit different, basically the same. Now, why do I think he said Holy Father here? He could have said Father, He's already established that earlier on in verse 1 when he says, Father, the hour has come, blah, blah, blah. So he's already called him Father once. But why did he put that moniker on the front, Holy Father? Now you can look up here. He's about ready to emphasize the concept of the name. God the Father is to keep him in the name. I love this too. He said, your name and my name are the same name. Thus, those of you that have a problem with the deity of Christ, one more connection to the deity right there. But that's another message. Let's go back to this. In the name. When he referred to the Father, that would be the benevolent act of God, God the Father. That's, that's not, not just benevolence because he's a giver, dads always give, that kind of thing. But also a relational family, familiar term, meaning that I'm a part of your forever family. So once I'm in your family, I never get kicked out. That's another passage of scripture. But the holy part is now talking about the righteous, holy name of God the Father. That means his authority, his right, his character, who he is, the entire purpose. So I am kept based on the promise the purpose, the character, everything that makes God God and named in his name tells me that I am kept by everything that he has. Now, here's a side challenge for some of you. I would encourage you to get a good Bible or a good book that will now delineate all the different names of God, all, and there are three of them, Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, then all the names of Jesus as it's connected from Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Tizkanu, Jehovah um, Um, Rapha, all the different names. Now, I've said this to you before, but really go with it. All those names are like a side of a diamond, and every time you look at that little sparkle on that side and sparkle on that side, you're not getting a different diamond. It's not a different God. It's all the same God. It's all a different way to look at that God that we have. So now, when I now go to him, and that God, the name of God, all that he is, is what is securing me in him. So everything about who he is. Every right, every potential, every purpose, every character of God, I'm secured by his name. I think that's absolutely beautiful. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, then God becomes your Father. And that name is yours. If you were uh, having a slumber party at your house, moms, dads, single parents, and your house was on fire... And you're hearing the cries of the children at the slumber party. But you heard your child say, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And someone else is saying, Uncle, 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 or Auntie, Auntie, Auntie. And yours is going, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. Human nature. Who would you go rescue first? Uh, Probably we should say the one closest to the flames. I, I get that. But you will have that inner tension because you know who's calling you first. Jesus says he'll protect us. How does he do it? I don't know how. I just know he does it in his name. So what does he protect us from? He protects us from the world. There's two components in this passage. One is the world and the other is Satan. But he does protect us from both of those. Go back to the passage here because it talks a lot about the world in it. Verse 10 says, all things that are, my, that are mine are yours, yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Verse 10, verse 11, I'm no longer in the world, so we're not talking necessarily the globe, planet Earth, it's the whole world system. I'm no longer in this, I'm part of the eternal being of God. I'm in the real reality, the disciples are in the virtual realities because they don't still, still see Satan around here. They can't see everything that I can see because I made it. I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. 
Verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished. Verse 13, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Now you can look up here. Do you know that I would have a whole lot of friends and probably virtually little or no tension and how I would socialize in almost any social group. I mean, I can go to the bar. I, I really could. I could go to Honky Tonks or whatever they call them in Texas or whatever. They, I could go to all those places. I can go into almost any different religious institution, whether it's a Unitarian church or a mosque or whatever. I could go to any of those places and I will have no conflict. I'll have no problem. And perhaps if I say certain things a certain way and act a certain way and bow a certain way and burn certain things certain times, if I do any of that, whatever it is, any culture, any society, political, religious, social, whatever, if I adapted to them, I would never have a problem. But all I would have to do then is to begin to say that I believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for our sins because we are depraved, lost sinners, hopeless without Christ, Nothing we could do ourselves could ever get us into heaven, and we would like to have an eternal relationship with Him, and I believe that He is God. I also believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God. I believe that this is the only book that is inspired by Almighty God, and we don't need any more books aside of this book, or in addition to this book. There's no other book above it. All the other books are below it. This is God's mind on paper. Now, I go into any bar, saloon, ism, spasm place that's out there, immediately, what do you think is going to happen? Don't go any further because it's pretty bloody. So let's go back to this. The only thing that separates me from that whole world is the Word of God and my choice to go public with that Word in my life, in my tongue, maybe my lifestyle. But it's all based upon the Word. So how does He protect me? Well, first of all, it doesn't mean I'm not going to get beat up and spit out by the world physically. But it does mean this. Listen carefully now. It does mean that the world and all of its information is not more powerful than the truth of God's word. Truth is more powerful than air and lies. Now, for some of you that are on the outside of your faith, you're saying, I, I, I really I, I have a hard time grabbing that. And I can understand that. I really can because sometimes we think, well, that's, G- that's Jesus, Christian truth, and you got secular truth, you got religious truth. Out here. So there, we're just comparing one information against the other information, and, and we're still fighting it all out. I, I get that from the other side of faith. But once you come into faith, there is an understanding that you will see that truth will always win out. And so when he's saying, I'm keeping you from, I'm protecting you from, I'm guarding you from that secular world system. Now watch carefully. That doesn't mean, though that he will prevent me from embracing a public world view. That's our choice. So you have a tension going on. The sovereignty of God that says, I will do this. And then you have the human responsibility that we do this. And by doing this, the answer to prayer is here. So how am I an answer to God's prayer for me as he's praying for me? As I now lean into the word right here, that truth of God's word is superior to the truth of the world as far as a philosophy of life. And I need to embrace that here and to really get to know that. Now watch. This is why often young people and maybe new believers have such a struggle with living a, 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 a sustaining Christian life is because somewhere along the line they have not been either taught the Word of God correctly, clearly, and here's another phrase, consistently. So they get a little here, a verse here, a verse there, a whole lot of music here, a little bit of this, a little activity here, a lot of fun, Bible sometimes, a DVD there, but they really don't engage in the real teachings of God's Word. And so God says, this Word is true, and I will protect you from the world, so I set you apart from the world by the Word right here. That's why we refer to two phrases. I am a Christ follower, and we are the community of the redeemed in Christ. So he protects us from the world and how beautiful that is. I don't know how he does it, but I know that he does it and the more I get into the word, I am protected from the world. I I need to say one more thing. Sometimes it's not merely the information of the world that gets me. 
It's when I yield to the information of the world system that is not biblical, that's what brings me down. The result of not just knowing it, it's believing it's right, following that kind of philosophy of life, that's what will bring me down. When I follow the word, and I know the word, I choose to follow the word, that doesn't mean I won't die. What it does mean that I'm still secure in Christ, and I have all the joy of the Lord. Now, this third, the second thing he protects us from, and how he does it, is, or is from Satan. I'll tell you, Satan is really out to get us, isn't he? Um, in the mornings, I get up real early and I exercise, and different people do different things with their exercising. I have been, while I'm exercising, it's easier for me. I, I can't read as much because I'm you know, too, too busy, too much motion. But I like a headset on. And so I'm listening to a whole series now from a, a Greek scholar type and I'm, st- I'm, I'm studying when it talks about the fiery darts of Satan where Satan now will shoot at me to bring me down as a person partner parent pastor Satan is out to bring me down okay what are his fiery darts and you know what his fiery darts are don't you it's the world system the temptations of the world that gets to me to get my eyes off the Lord that I begin to crumble And so how does he protect me? By all the armor of God that he provides for me. And I don't have time to unpack that. Go to Ephesians 6. But he says, I will protect him. I am secure in Christ. Why? The word is more superior than the world. The armor that he provides in Christ is my protection by God from Satan's fiery darts. And so he says, that's how I protect you. Now, the next question is, is, why does he do this? And we're going to bring this to a close now. Why would he protect me? In the context here, I think there's two reasons. And you know how you know what the reasons are? When you read through scriptures, a little bit about reading scripture, look for the phrase that says, so or so that, or that. So let's look at them very quickly, if you will. Verse 11, it says, you have, uh, the name which you have given me, that they may be even as we are, which would be one, all right? If you go a little bit further, it talks about so that, He says there in verse 13, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy. So every time you see the so that, that's answering so much the why question. So why does he protect us? When it talks about it, the first part here, that they may be one as we are one, in your margin you could write the word unity there if you want to. And I love that. Look up here for just a moment. Why does he do that? so that we would enjoy the intimate fellowship that God the Father has with God the Son, that they now would be one with Him and with each other. Now, don't go to sleep. This is is key. He has done all of this praying for our protection so we could enjoy the same intimacy that God the Father has with God the Son. Now, practically speaking, we still have our fleshy mind that wanders at times, so we'll never experience practically that level of intimacy until we get to heaven. That's why he says, I'm securing you so that you will have that then, and you can have a measure of that now and a growing measure of it as you are now putting Christ center. So we are getting intimate with him. But then we can be intimate with each other to the degree that we have at the center of our relationship God's word in the hands of God the Spirit that is bringing God the children together in unity. So why does he do that? To bring us together in unity with one another on the authority of his word as God the Father and God the Son have it together. Now, that is so rich. You'll want to be here next week because I want to unpack that because it sounds so mystical and I'm going to show it to you from a practical passage uh, uh, perspective through the rest of this chapter. So I'm going to leave that now if you don't mind me doing that, but I do want to talk about the unity next week. But the next says, so that they may have the full measure of my joy. Do you have that? The full measure of my joy. And here's why I want to end with this. He's praying that they would have, the disciples, the full measure of my joy. Not joy, but my joy. Would you use your mind for a second with a sanctified imagination? Where was Jesus when he was praying this prayer? Anybody? More than likely, he'd already left the upper room, so he's on his way to Gethsemane. So he's kind of like walking through the streets of Jerusalem, getting himself to the next destination. Okay, I got that. What was the next destination? Gethsemane. Well, why was he going to that place? What was going to happen in just a few short hours? What do you think was going to happen? He was going to be betrayed by, Psalm 49 says, his familiar friend, Can you imagine how that is? 
And then he's saying, I want them to have my joy knowing I'm going to be going into this, that I'm going to be going into the trial, that I'm going to be going into the torture, that I'm going to be going up on the cross, and I'm going to be bleeding and suffering on this cross. And then there's going to be that moment he knows where God the Father has got to turn his head away when Jesus is the sin of the world on himself, and he has to cry out, why have you forsaken me? He's got to go through all of that. And he still can say, with all of that, I want them to have my joy. I think it's because he already knew that those guys, many of them, will go through their own form of torture. Now, Jesus' torture for that time was, you know, just a day, we'll say. I'm, I'm just giving it to you in a general term. These guys, once they went public with their faith, they would be basically running for their lives and running to ministries until they finally were killed. And so he was saying, I want them to have my joy. Not my future joy, but my joy. Not my past joy, but my joy. So he could say my present tense joy, my joy. I want them to have my joy, even though they know they're going to go. So he's praying that they would have that. Now, my question to you is, this is really heavy now. You ready? Here it is. Was there any prayer that God the Son asked of the Father that the Father didn't grant? So if there was that joy that was given by the Son, affirmed by the Father, it's available for you and me. So when we talk about where the answer to the Lord's Prayer, the real question is, is do you have joy? Are you experiencing unity? Are you realizing that our enemy is going to be the world system as it's dominated by Satan? Do you realize that this son of perdition is really for referring to Judas? Now, when you say, well, he didn't, he didn't protect Judas. Of course he did, because Judas wasn't a believer. And Judas made his own choices, although God said sovereignly this was going to happen. And so that's part of it. But from the evil one, could I be protected from the evil one? Look up here. I will not be separated from the evil one. That's why he said, they'll be in the world, but not of the world. I'm going to leave him here. But I don't have to be vitally connected to Satan. He can protect. How does he do that? Oh, my word. That's multiple series of sermons. He does it through the word. He does it through the uh, um, um, confrontation of other believers to come alongside us and warn us and caution us and teach us and remind us and, and um, um, uh, confront us when we're doing something wrong. He does it through the systems of life that brings us back to why is this happening, Lord? I want to see more of you. There's so many ways he's protecting us from the world and we can have the joy. So now, what are you fearing right now in your life? What are you dealing with right now? Jesus the Son asked the Father, for that protection in your life. And it's all available right there. You are secure in Him. So maybe your first prayer will be, Lord, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me. I look to Jesus. He is God in the flesh, the deity, who as God-man went to the cross, died again, rose, died and rose again. And I'm trusting in Him as my Savior. That's just step one. But without that step, none of the others matter. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> I want you to know that a lot of this information that I give you, I do that because there are so many different people listening to the voice of the sermon. They're on the radio. They're on the internet. They're on CDs. We have people coming and going in here. I don't know where you are. Some need to have, because they're, they're Bible uh, leaders or preachers and missionaries that are coming in that have had a lot of this training. They need to think even deeper, uh, not leave what they've learned, but to build on what they've learned. They need more. Some of you are on the very front end, and all of this is like, wow, this is so much. This is like a banquet. And I, I just came for a hot dog, you know. I understand that. So what you do is you take what you can and celebrate that and thank the Lord that you got that, but you know that the beauty of it all, there's a whole lot more than just the front door to... Um, the magic kingdom. There's a whole lot more inside. And if you like the little bit, the best is yet to come. So today, here's what we learn. The Lord prayed about his own glory that he would receive for all eternity. That you might have life. And this is eternal life. That you may know him forever. And secondly, he began praying for his disciples. His main was to pray that they would be kept and guarded. They'd be secure. So there would be eternity and security. And we are part of that. How does he do it? Through his name. Get to know his name. Trust the authority and the character of a name that's holy and righteous. Cannot lie. Cannot sin. Cannot go back on promises. Will do everything he said he can do because he can do. He can not only make a promise... 
He can keep a promise because he is almighty, righteous, holy God. You are secure. That's how. From what? Satan. Satan will come after you like he did Peter. Sift him. But that sifting like wheat is good because it shows you the good from the bad and you can deal with it. So he'll sift us. Like Job. Came after Job. All the bastions of hell, so to speak, came against Job in the Bible. Lost his health, his finances, family except for his wife. And yet he could still say, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. So, yes, Satan came against him but didn't get Job. Job's faith held on right to the end because God the Father, through God the Son prayer, held on to him like he will you and me. So Satan doesn't have to have you. The world doesn't have to have you. And why? So you can have unity with the Father, unity with one another. At least develop a community with them. And it's centered on the Word so you can have the fullness of joy. That's our Jesus. That's who we come to know deeply and intimately. And with all of that, like the disciples, we go public, locally and globally. Perhaps there's someone here that is ready to place their faith in Christ. I'd like to pray for you. Remember, it's not how much faith you have. It's the little bit that you have, but it has to be in the right object. Jesus Christ. And you can trust in Christ alone because of his work that he did for us on the cross as Almighty God. So you might say something like this. It's not even a prayer, but it is an acknowledgement that Jesus is the Lord who died for you and me on the cross. And you are trusting in him, coming to him just as you are as a sinner, desperately in need of a Savior and knowing that Christ is the Savior. Somehow in the midst of all that, you are saved as you're going through that mental transaction of total, complete trust in him. Do that and do that right now. I'm going to ask you in a moment to slip up your hand if you're doing that today. You've never done it before. You can put it on the card if you want, but writing a card, standing up, walking forward, none of that will get you into heaven. So I want you to know it's just by faith. i just like to pray for you because I I love you and I want to kind of welcome you as one of his children, as my sister or brother in Christ today. For the rest of you that know Christ as Savior, would you just right now celebrate in your heart the Lord, that he loved you. He not only went to the cross, but he prayed for you before the cross and since the cross and continues to connect to God the Father as one on your and my behalf. Would you celebrate him? Would you thank him for his forgiveness? Would you thank him for his power and for today's message and what we've learned? Would you thank him for your protection, your security, where he keeps and he guards you through his word, through his spirit, through his name. You do that. Now, for those of you that today you're trusting Christ as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. You've never done it before. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. And when you do, I'm just going to acknowledge that hand and say thank you and that's it. But I'll know that someone here did that. Now, you don't have to do that. You can go to heaven without ever raising your hand. I got that. You get that. God certainly gets that. He said it's by faith, inwardly. But if you'd like me to pray for you, that's what I'm asking for. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, let's do it right now. Is there anyone here today that would lift up your hand indicating that today's the day you called upon Jesus Christ as the Lord to be your Savior? Would you put your hand up right now? Anyway, put it up, put it up. Okay, Christians, how many of you would like to have prayer because today is the day that you want to just thank the Lord that He is keeping you secure, He is guarding you, that you will never falter. Your, your faith may wobble at times. And even then, he says, even when you believe not, he abides faithful because he cannot deny his own himself. He can't do that. And that's the God you have. And you're secure in him. And you'd like for me to pray for you because you're celebrating the security you have in Christ and you're resting in him. Would you raise your hands or anyone? God bless you. God bless you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Father, that you have prayed this prayer. It's a prayer that's answerable and that you've chosen to have it recorded in Scripture and John accurately provided it for us today. And that, Father, like the disciples of old, we have many of the same human traits and sinful character. And, Father, we thank you that you love us, you paid for our sins, and that you continue to intercede for us on our behalf and that we are secure in you that nothing will separate us from the love of God. Now, Father, let us go out 
living like we believe that because we do and then telling others about you so they could enjoy that same relationship of security in Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.